I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll read to, together verses 16 through 20. And it will be a bit of a topical uh, sermon. We won't unpack every verse. We'll just focus on one verse, verse 20 of 2 Corinthians 1. Uh, in light of this Advent season and in light of uh, God's uh, covenant sign being placed on Zoe, we remember uh, this main truth from 2 Corinthians 1 that God is indeed faithful to his word. And before we do read and, and hear God's word proclaim, let's just ask a brief blessing on this word. Father in heaven, again, we thank you so much for your word. It is food for our souls in this pilgrim journey that we're on. And we pray that in this time of our worship service, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts might be pleasing in your sight. We pray that you would magnify your own beloved son in our midst, that we might hear his voice speaking to us, and that we might leave this place following him in faith. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 beginning in verse 15. This is God's word. Paul writes, Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first, so that you might have a second experience of grace. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia, and to come back to you from Macedonia, and to have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom he proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him we utter our amen to God for his glory. Indeed, may God bless the preaching of his word now to our hearts. Well, brothers and sisters, have you ever uh, failed to keep your word to someone? You know, it's a bit of a silly question because all of us to some degree have uh, failed to, to keep our words and to keep our vows Maybe you've uh, told someone that you would do something for them and you just simply forgot. You forgot and you failed to do what you said. Uh, Maybe you said you would be somewhere at some point and you forgot. Oh, that was on my calendar today. Totally forgot. I'm sorry I didn't show up. Uh, Maybe if you're a child and maybe a teenager, maybe you've missed curfew and you weren't home when you were supposed to be. Uh, Maybe you forgot to do some of your chores and when your mom and dad came home, you felt a little bit embarrassed. Maybe you forgot that word you promised to to be good to your sibling, right? And you failed to to keep that word uh, to your parents. Uh, We've all failed to keep our words, haven't we? Uh, Not only do people fail us, but we live in a world that just lets us down, right? We live in in a time where especially we feel that. We have expectations for school, for work, for our own life, and what things might look like, and we find ourselves let down again and again and again. We live in a fallen world, and because of that, uh, people fail us, and circumstances sometimes just let us down. But beloved, into a world of failed promises and into a world of letdowns, uh, we are reminded of our God who does not let us down. We're reminded of the faithfulness of God who is alone that stability in our life that never lets us down. And into this world of letdowns, God shows us this Advent season of his faithfulness. You see, one of the greatest evidences that God is faithful to his word is what we celebrate at Christmas. That God was faithful to his word to send Jesus into this world. When Jesus came 2,000 years ago on that first Christmas morning, he came and he fulfilled a whole host of promises to show that God is faithful. And every Advent season, God is preaching to us, among many things, this message, that he is faithful. And today we want to meditate on those things. Again, looking at just one verse about the fulfillment of God's word in Jesus Christ. The first thing that we'll see simply is this. God makes promises. God, he makes promises. Notice verse 20. 
First, it says, for all the promises of God. That's how it starts. All the promises of God. Today, we saw the kind of promise, didn't we, in baptism. God put a sign on little Zoe's head and and made a promise to her to be her God. But ever since the very beginning of the Bible, God has been making promises. Uh, In the very beginning of the Bible, after sin entered this world in Genesis chapter 3, we see there in Genesis 3.15 this promise of God that in the midst of this enmity between the seed of the serpent, the devil, and the seed of the woman, Eve, uh, God would send forth a champion, someone who's going to reverse this curse in this world and make his blessing flow as far as the curse is found. The promise of God's salvation was planted in the cursed soils of Eden like a seed. And throughout the Old Testament, you see the seed of God's gospel promise growing and taking new form. We confess this as a Reformed church in our Heidelberg Catechism question and answer 19. It says that the gospel in the Old Testament was preached, it was portrayed, and it was prophesied about. We heard about this earlier. The gospel was preached even in its Old Testament form to Abraham in Genesis 12 when God said to him, I will bless you, Abraham, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Paul says in Galatians, that's actually the gospel proclaimed to Abraham. God actually portrayed the gospel in the Old Testament. To Moses, you remember uh, the sacrificial system was set up. There was blood that was being spilt for the people's sins. God set up the priestly system. He set up things like the Passover. He set up various sabbatical rhythms. And all of this pointed to the gospel, forgiveness of sins through Christ's blood, the need for a perfect mediator, and the eternal rest that he would bring. God preached the gospel, he portrayed it, and he prophesied about the gospel of Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, The gospel continued to be revealed in in who this Messiah would be and some things about his life. In Isaiah 7, we learn about how the Messiah would be born. He would be born of a virgin. In Isaiah 53, we learn about his life, that he would be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. In Jeremiah 31, we learn about why Jesus came. He came to establish a new covenant to bring true forgiveness by his blood and to write his law on our hearts. The Old Testament ends longing for the Messiah. In our English Bibles, the last Old Testament book is the book of Malachi. And in that book, you see a note of longing looking forward to the forerunner who would come and prepare the way for the Lord. And so you, you leave the Old Testament looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, longing for him. All throughout the Old Testament, God was at work in powerful ways. But when you come to the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, there's 400 years of silence in between Malachi and Matthew. There's no new promises made in that gap. There's no new revelations. There's no visions. There's no more prophets, just silence. And in that time, we might wonder, the people might have wondered, is God like us, making promises but not keeping them? You know, in the Old Testament, God's people must have wrestled with that thought at times, does God actually keep his word? Think of Abraham's story. God said to him, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. But for years, Abraham had to look at himself and his old and barren wife, and who was past the point of childbearing, and he probably wondered many times, will God be faithful to his word? God said to Abraham, all of this land of Canaan, I'm going to give to you. But when he got there, you remember Genesis 12, there was a famine. And then God told him, there's going to be for a time Canaanites in the land. Think of Joseph's story. God said to him, you're going to rule over your brothers and your own family. But in the very next scene, Joseph is cast into the pit, sold as a slave, and later 
he's put in prison. Oftentimes, beloved, in the Bible, there was a gap between what God had promised and the people's present reality that they experienced day after day. And that kind of gap led them to wonder if God was faithful to his word, especially in those times of silence and suffering. I think those are things that we can resonate with as God's people. But God is the master storyteller, isn't he? Uh, we love good stories, don't we? And, 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 and the Bible is an unfolding story, an unfolding drama of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And in every story, every good story, you, you need that key component of conflict or a problem before the resolution comes. And in the Bible, God allows these difficult and these dark circumstances to take place for a season in order that he might show that his power alone can save. He permits and allows sin and brokenness and desperate circumstances to magnify his grace and to show that even in the difficulty, his grace is sufficient to carry us through. And this is what we see leading up to that first Christmas morning. After 400 years of silence, God spoke into this dark world a glorious message of hope and salvation. In Luke chapter 2, an angel comes on the scene finally after all this time of silence and says, Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy which will be for all the people. Again in Galatians 4 verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law. We see that God not only makes promises, but God keeps them. And that's our second point. God is a God who makes promises, but second, he keeps his word. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. In the context of 2 Corinthians here in chapter 1, Paul is uh, stating why his plans uh, towards the Corinthians are not undivided. Um, he's not saying, look, I'm not going back and forth in my plans, right? Saying, yes, I'm coming. No, I'm not coming, right? He's not, you know, clicking on the Facebook invite, you know, going, not going, not interested, right? He's not saying, I'm not going back and forth. And, and the reason he gives is because God is faithful, and God is not divided about what he says, but in Jesus Christ, his promises are always yes. In Matthew chapter 1 and in Matthew chapter 2, we see a few of God's yeses to the promises that he made even in the birth of Jesus. Children, as you probably know, there's four gospel accounts, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and each one puts their focus on Jesus, but gives us a couple of different aspects of his life, and they carry a couple of different purposes for why they were written. And part of Matthew's purpose in his gospel account is to convince skeptical Jewish people that Jesus really is the Messiah. And so he shows them throughout the gospel how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament promises. And consider just a few of them that he highlights concerning especially the birth of Jesus. In Matthew 1, verse 17, he shows us how Jesus is the one who is born in David's line. In Matthew 1, verse 22, he shows us how Jesus is born of a virgin, according to the promise of Isaiah 7. In Matthew 2, verse 5 and 6, he tells us how Jesus was born in Bethlehem according to the promise of Micah 5. He tells us in Matthew 2, verse 15, how Jesus had to flee uh, with his family because of persecution. And that fulfilled God's word too. In Matthew 2, verse 23, he was raised in Nazareth in order to fulfill God's word. Matthew is showing us that Jesus is the Christ and he is the yes to God's promises. Now, someone might object and say, well, you know, the Bible seems rigged. 
Looks like Jesus was just intentionally fulfilling all these things because they, he, you know, he knew what was said of him in the Old Testament. But again, consider the nature of these prophecies, of these promises. That his lineage would come from David. That his birth would be in Bethlehem. That he would make that trip to Egypt. That his life would be in Nazareth. How could Jesus, as a baby, consciously fulfill these prophecies? Neither he nor his parents had control over his ancestry. Uh, His birth in Bethlehem, you remember, was the result of a mandate made by Caesar Augustus. His parents' move to Egypt was prompted by King Herod's persecution. And once Herod died, the parents naturally decided to resettle here in Nazareth. Think about that. Many of the prophecies were fulfilled apart from the knowledge of Jesus as a baby And some of the promises were fulfilled even by God's enemies making these decrees. What are the odds that one man could fulfill all of these promises made hundreds of years beforehand by different prophets who lived in different parts of the world? Apart from the divine hand of God, the probability would just be beyond comprehension. Uh, Maybe you know uh, the book, A Case for Christ. It's a very a uh, popular book, a bit old now, but it's written by Lee Strobel. And he quotes uh, Professor Peter Stoner, who's the chairman of uh, Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena College on this point, about the probability of Jesus fulfilling these prophecies. And in 1960, he, he took eight students, I'm sorry, he took his students to um, do a probability study of what it would mean for Jesus to fulfill just eight of the Old Testament prophecies. You know what the probability was that they came up with? One in 10 to the 17th power. You know, children, the word 1,000 has three zeros in it, right? Now, this number has 17 zeros in it, right? That's a huge number. One in 10 to the 17th power. That's the odds. And he gives this illustration that I think is pretty cool. He says, imagine taking a 10 to the 17th number of silver dollars and laying those across the whole state of Texas two feet deep. That's how much, that's how many coins would cover uh, Texas. And he says, imagine just taking one of those coins that cover all the state of Texas and putting a little X on the coin and then, you know, putting that randomly, you know, in the pile as it were. And then he says, now imagine blindfolding someone And then having them walk all around the state of Texas, going wherever they wanted, and and randomly putting their hand down into the pile of coins and picking up the right one. What's the odds that a blindfolded man could pick up the right coin? And that's the same chance that Jesus would have to fulfill all of these prophecies, just eight of them from the Old Testament. But as we know, beloved, one person has fulfilled these words, Jesus of Nazareth, our Lord. In Luke chapter 24, verse 44, he said to his disciples, These are the words which I have spoken to you while I was with you, that all the things which were written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Because this story is not by chance, but by the divine hand of God, we see that Jesus, he is the amen to God's promises. See, again, the people wondered throughout the Old Testament story, is God faithful to his word? And God says in the sending of Jesus Christ, yes. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is God's incarnate Amen to all of the promises of God. Not only some, but all. He answers the questions that are on our hearts. Does God really care about this world that we're living in? Does God love me? Is there hope after death? Is there an end to everything that's going on today? Is there a light truly at the end of the tunnel? Or are we just going on and on and on, spinning our wheels? The answer of the Bible, because of Jesus, is yes. 
you look at the manger at that first Christmas and you see God's nearness to this world. You look to the cross of Jesus where God incarnate is hanging for our sins and you see God's love for sinners. You look at the empty tomb of Jesus and you see victory over death, victory over sin, the guarantee of a brighter day. All the promises of God, beloved, find their yes and amen in Jesus. And when you have Jesus at the center of these things, you could go back to the scriptures and you see God's fingerprints, don't you, on every single page. Beloved, in this world, everything fails us. Politics fail us. Programs fail us. Leaders fail us. Churches can fail us. Friends fail us fail us. I fail. You fail. We all fail. Beloved, God alone is the only person who cannot fail his people. It's impossible for him to fail you. It's impossible for him to sin against you. And aren't you so glad for that today? That God's heart towards you on this Lord's day hasn't changed? It wasn't, yes, I will be your God Last week, but today you've been struggling, not anymore. It's not yes and no. It doesn't fluctuate based on your performance, based upon how well you've done. But in Jesus, it's always yes towards you, God's promises. Aren't you so glad that God doesn't change his plans? That he doesn't change his mind about you in this world? That gospel seed that was planted in the cursed soils of Eden has come to fruition in Jesus Christ and it continues to grow. It continues to bear fruit throughout this world as the gospel is proclaimed and people are brought into the light of God's kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. God is faithful to his word. and He's faithful to you again this morning. What's our response to this? God makes promises God keeps his word. So finally, our last point as we conclude, God can be trusted. God can be trusted. Notice the verse, how it goes on in verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him we utter our amen to God for his glory. Because God is faithful to us in Jesus, we can utter amen to God. What does that little word mean, amen? Right, it's not just the signing off of our prayers. I'm all done praying, Lord, amen. It's not like pressing send on an email. Give it to God, I'm done. No, amen in scripture is a word of strong affirmation. It's a word of undoubting faith. Yes, Lord, I believe who you are. I believe what you have said. I believe what you have promised. Yes, Lord, I trust you. Amen. And Paul is saying, look, we can say our amen to God because God has given to us his amen in Christ. He has said to this world, look at Jesus, I am faithful, the incarnate, amen. And so through him, Paul says, we give to God our amen. We can say amen to the Lord even in these hard times, even when there's silence, Again, even when there's a gap between what God has promised and our circumstances, even when there's confusion, even when it seems like evil is winning the day, we can say to God, amen to your promise. I trust that you are faithful. You will bring deliverance. And even now, you are building your kingdom and the gates of hell will not prevail. We can say amen to God even when he's not operating according to our timetable. When we think things should be a certain way and when when God's doing something else, we're reminded of his word. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We can say even in the confusion, yes, Lord, I trust you. Your ways are better than my ways. We could say amen to God even when it seems like he's not working in our lives, when we just feel far from him, when we're waiting on him to show himself faithful. 
Again, we see on this first Christmas morning that God was working behind the scenes in the humble little town of Bethlehem through the ordinary circumstances of life for Mary and Joseph. He was bringing them exactly to where they needed to be to bring the Son of God into this world according to the flesh. Beloved, we can trust God this morning because God has given to us his amen in Jesus Christ. The question for us as we hear these things, as we hear God's promises, who he is, and what he's done, the question is, have we said amen back to God? Have we heard about God and Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection? Have we heard of these things and said to God this morning, yes, Lord, that's true, and you did that for me. Amen. Or have we said no to God? Do we push him away? Do we give no thought to the things that he has done? Beloved, during the Advent season, God reminds you of this message that he is faithful. Jesus came according to the scriptures. And beloved, Jesus will come again according to the scriptures. In this world of letdowns, into this world where people fail you, put your hope this morning in the God who does not fail his people Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, we can have confidence in him in the days ahead. In the words of Psalm 62, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much and we praise you for who you are, your very character, that you do not fail. You don't try to accomplish your purposes. You don't try to make things right in this sin-cursed world, but, but you do all that you please. You have never failed in the past and you will never fail in the future. And Lord, how that is such good news for us. We thank you so much for your beloved son, our Lord Jesus, who is your amen to all of your promises. Right now, he is at your right hand in our flesh as the guarantee that where he is, we will be also. Lord, write that truth deep in our hearts in this dark world of letdowns that we're living in, that we might live with true hope and peace because of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you again for your word. We ask that you would again lead us by it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, our song of response is a little bit different from our bulletin. Um, in light of this theme of God's faithfulness, we'll sing a number 408, uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Uh, the pianist has already agreed, and so is the sound people. So it should be up there on the screen, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs> 